All right. So we have a super special treat for you next. I'm so excited. I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Lori Marvis. She is a renowned board certified lifestyle and family medicine physician, licensed to practice in all 50 states. So slacker, she is not. <laughs> also Washington, D.C. She embodies professional versatility and expertise Dr. Marbus is committed to delivering personalized, top-notch healthcare solutions tailored to your unique needs. So thank you so much for being here with us. I am going to turn over the mic or maybe rather share the mic with Dr. Lori Marbus. Thank you for being here. Hi, thank you for having me. This is great. It, these are my daughter's cats, so if they jump up here. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I've got a couple in my background too, and you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> it's interesting, right? <laughs> absolutely. Um, so I told everyone you were coming and yes. I asked if they had any questions and yes. it was like a million hands went up in the air. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Those are some good questions. So they're very common. So I appreciate uh, everything that they're asking. So good. Good, good, good. Um, so if it's okay, we'll just jump right in and fire through. Is that good? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Let's awesome. Go. <laughs> so let's start with one. And I know, and you give your own disclaimer, you know, certainly we understand you in it's limited what you can do in a group setting as far as personal recommendations, but <clears throat> excuse me, can you walk us through making the decision to go with statins mm -hmm. or to not go with statins? Yeah. So again, this come really comes down to the person and their risk factors, right? So if I have someone who has an elevated cholesterol and maybe the LDL is like 102 or 110, they're relatively young, 35 to 45, their coronary artery calcium score is zero, their inflammatory marks are zero. This is a discussion. Probably you're okay. Let's just tweak the diet and do some other things. If I have someone who's 65, you know, coronary artery and calcium score is over, let's say 500, and they've had a maybe a cardiac event in the past, or their LDL is definitely over 190, these are very different scenarios, right? And so I think that's where we kind of fall into trouble in the plant-based space is there's a lot of blanket suggestions. Um, and I mean, no disrespect from the gurus in our space because they have really... <laughs> paved the way for so much of us to, to walk, um, behind them. But I think there is evidence. Um, and I've had patients who were plant-based who went on to have heart attacks. So this is not something to ignore just because someone decides to go plant-based one day does not mitigate all of those things that have gone on for decades before. So it really is a personalized decision. If someone, it gets an educated discussion on all the risk factors and all the potential um, things that they can do, and they still choose not to, that is fine, but at least they've made a very educated decision. And so um, I look at each person and we go deep into what they're actually doing. What does their diet actually look like? Um, some people say they're eating a whole food plant-based diet. <clears throat> not eating a plant -based diet. Um, <laughs> they'd like to say that they are. Um, but then again, there are some who are very strict, let me like SOS free and they're doing everything right. And those numbers still can't come down and they're still at a high risk. So my job at the end of the day is to make you, I would hope to live as long and healthy as possible. And if that requires some medication, that's okay. Um, there's no shame in that. Right. And, um, I think there's almost some shaming that occurs in the plant-based space. If someone chooses to have medication or is on medication, they're afraid to say it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I just want to highlight that for sure. So, yeah. 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 Thank you for, for bringing up that point. I think it's super important because it's so um, inspiring all the things that can be addressed and fixed with the plant-based lifestyle. And that's what's brought us all here. Right. And we're still humans and we have history and, you know, and, and we need help. And the goal is not just to be, um, plant-based forever for our whole lives, but to actually be healthy our, our whole lives. And, and I mean, take multiple tools. So I thanks for right. bringing up that shame fe feature, because I think it's a, something a lot of people battle with for sure. Absolutely. Um, so uh, there's a question that just popped up in the chat, um, about an, on the same, along the same lines, osteoporosis drugs for Fosamax and if they're actually necessary. Um, I really, again, I think this becomes an individual discussion. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of 
having these discussions earlier in life. So mm -hmm. if you're a grandmother or a mother, or you have young women and men, but especially women in your life, it's really important that we discuss with them. Prevention starts in pediatrics um, mm -hmm. because we need to build up as much of that bone mineral density as possible before age 30 when we start seeing studies that decline that occurs. And of course it's accelerated once the estrogen is starting to be depleted in this perimenopausal, menopausal stage. Um, so with that being that preface, do we utilize medications? And I think this goes to back if you've had what we call a fragility fracture, right? Have you had a hip fracture? Do you have uh, a vertebral uh, fracture where you know the actual bone is collapsed upon itself? These are different discussions. It's kind of like someone who's had a heart attack versus someone who has osteoporosis or maybe the mm -hmm. severity. Um, what are their risk factors of actually having a fracture. And then we look at what are these medications, because there's a variety of different ones that you could be utilizing. And what are those risk factors? Would you actually see some benefit? Again, this is a, a risk benefit analysis, but there are some very important things we should be doing dietary wise and movement wise, which is, of course, make sure you're getting at least a thousand to 1200 milligrams in your diet of calcium daily. Make sure your vitamin D level is um, where it needs to be, which is above 30 when you check out labs. And I would say 30 to 80. Um, you don't want to go too high in vitamin D. I, I've seen patients come in on mega doses of vitamin D, completely unnecessary and can be toxic. Um, and then of course, resistance training, resistance training, the more lean muscle mass that you have, um, the better, right? You're going to be better at balance. You're less likely to fall. Um, and it's just really understanding that we need to be doing those things on a daily basis. Um, but as far as the medications, again, it really will depend. If someone's had a fracture, I would be more inclined to encourage them to utilize some of these medications. Now, some of these medications have some nasty side effects, and these are not something to take lightly, um, like the Fosamax and some other things like jaw necrosis and things. But again, it's a discussion to have with someone in what are, you know, if I have a little older lady who's very fragile, um, we're going to do everything we can to prevent another fracture because once you have that hip fracture, your morbidity mortality increases quite substantially. Yeah. So the prevention yeah. is key. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's been a lot of conversation. There were probably, I don't know, 30% of the questions were about menopause, perimenopause, yeah. postmenopause. So yeah. should I just, can you just sort of summarize for us things that we should be thinking about yeah. in these phases as far as diets, medications and whatnot? Sure. Um, first of all, you, to understand that things change and that a plant-based diet doesn't make menopause just magically happen and no problems. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> not the way it works. Um, <laughs> Having, I mean, I'm 53 and going through this perimenopausal thing, it's different than what I was 10 years ago. Um, the diet's different. You're going to have to work a little harder to mm -hmm. lose weight. You still can. You can still absolutely build muscle. You can, you know, literally cause amazing body composition changes. That is absolutely possible. You have to think things about a little bit differently. Um, some women will need hormone replacement therapy, right? And again, it'll depend on risk factors in their family, their genetics, um, you know, what are the severity of their symptoms? You know, if you get a hot flash here and there, no big deal. Some women, it's absolutely detrimental, but it's the mood changes, the sexual dysfunction, um, you you get body aches. There's so much that comes with this that again, it comes down to what is the individual risk factors if they want to engage with hormone replacement therapy and um, long-term you know, how long they should be on it. So typically what we look at with HRT, and I am not a big fan of the bioidentical, those are not regulated. I would use medications that are already um, with pre-prescribed amounts for the FDA regulates. Um, the ones that are compounded, you're just not, it's a little harder to make sure you're getting what you should be getting. Um, anyway, but again, these can be life-changing for many women. The guidelines typically say starting within, you know, five years of menopause onset, um, perimenopausal onset, and you want to use the lower medication as, as possible to mitigate the symptoms. And um, yeah, and so you typically probably don't want to start them after 10 years after you've been on menopause, because then you have increased risk of some other things. Um, but that's the HRT. Now, as far as diet, lots of things you can do. Um, I'm a big fan of using chronometer or my fitness pal chronometer is a little bit more accurate again, logging your food, right? Because if it's not measured, it's not managed. That is 
but just the way we are. So if you'll go in and just put even for a week, everything that you're eating, make sure you're hitting that thousand to 1200 milligrams daily of calcium. Take your vitamin D supplements. Many of us are low. I take 2000 daily. Um, my, my levels still, they hit maybe 40 sometimes depending on the time of year. And I'm outside all the time. I live in Southern California. Um, and so those are some things there. Uh, again, the resistance training is peace, making sure we look at stress and all those different things. Um, and making sure your protein is elevated. Um, I think there's, again, you know, we've always say, you know, you can get plenty of protein on a plant-based diet. And yes, you can, if you focus in on the beans and the whole grains, but I have so many people who come in in different, you know, uh, gurus are saying you need to eat this. If you are 65, you're five foot two and you're hundred pounds dripping wet. And they're trying to eat a pound of greens a day. There's not much room left in their appetite to get everything that they need. And we're really wanting to decrease risk of sarcopenia, which is loss of loss of the muscle mass, which again, prevents so many things and makes you more insulin sensitive. So if you're struggling with elevated cholesterol or blood sugars and you're insulin resistant, you know, more muscle mass, lean muscle mass, the better. So um, yeah. So again, I think there's, there's other things you can do. Um, there's some supplements that might be helpful depending like black cohosh, uh, that might be helpful for some of the more vasomotor type things, difficulty sleeping. Um, again, yeah, it really depends. Make sure your ferritin is elevated to above 50. If some women may find that, um, they're starting to have hair loss, uh, they're having uh, restless leg syndrome. So ferritin is in uh, iron storage. So you want to, if you check your ferritin, if they check your iron, it could be normal, quote unquote normal. But if your ferritin is below 50 or 75, you can have symptoms. Almost, if you look at the research, if I can get women to take in more iron rich foods and we get their absorption up again, it'll depend why are they low in iron? Are they having menstrual bleeding, if they're still having menses, is there something else going on that we need to be paying attention to? Is it not enough in the food that they're getting? Are they not absorbing it? Are they losing it? Right. So you have to look at everything. Um, are they low in B12? Are you supplementing adequately with B12? So many things that labs can help in discussion on really what they're doing, but this is not just a plant-based diet. And I want to make sure that I make sure that yes, I am. I have been eating a plant-based diet for 12 years. I still feel it's the most, it's the most wonderful thing. It's anti-inflammatory, but we need to pay attention to a few things because some people get even further restrictive than eating. Like some people will not eat nuts. They mm -hmm. will not, they will not eat seeds and nuts, um, which is extremely frustrating because there's no data showing these are unhelpful. They are very helpful. They have to be careful as they are high in calories, but a quarter cup of nuts a day per, for women is fine. Um, and even if you have heart disease, you just, it's just, yeah, we're, we're losing a great source of ALA, which is the precursors to the long chain fatty acids. Um, so if it's much better than, let's say you have someone who's on the omnivorous diet, they also have, you know, micronutrient deficiencies, many times low in B12. Uh, but again, so eating a whole food plant-based diet, you're reducing your risk of so many things, but it's also, we really just need to pay attention and make sure we're doing it right. Cause our food is not grown in the soil that is nutrient rich, like it was a hundred years ago as well. You know, where are they getting their food? What are they eating? Um, again, what medications are someone on? Maybe it's decreasing absorption. So lots of things can affect Thanks. Sorry, I went off on a tangent there. Yeah, no, it's all good. I, there's lots to talk about. So yeah, yeah, I think that's great. Tangents are wonderful. Um, yeah, good stuff. Okay. So let's transition to thyroid disease, Hashimoto's, gluten, weight loss. Yep. So I was diagnosed, I have three kids, uh, 29, 27, 25. Um when my middle one was born, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's back then. So I was 26 years old. And um, whoops. I, uh, I will tell you that um, the medications will get you into a euthyroid where your thyroid is appropriate. Make sure that you're looking at that. Um, sometimes you'll see some patients who are within the normal range, but need to be a little bit tighter controlled. So let's say your TSH is above 2.5, maybe need to be closer to 2.5 or a little bit lower to feel 
better. Everyone's going to have a little bit different metabolism where they feel well. I know I don't feel well if my my um, thyroid is, my TSH isn't under 2.5. My cholesterol also goes up um, if my thyroid is out of whack. So with Hashimoto's, this is an autoimmune disease. It's one of the most common autoimmune diseases, especially in the United States. It does go back to gut health. I'm pretty sure it was the dairy I was consuming. I didn't eat a whole lot of meat, but Definitely love their dairy back in the day. Um, and so these are things that we need to be mindful of is how can we really build a healthy gut? And of course, eating the fiber and all those great things that we're already doing. Um, but what's cool about it, though, is I'll just share a quick story. When I went plant-based um, in 2012, um, early 2012, I never even thought about my thyroid, like getting better. I never thought in a million years. Um, but what happened was uh, I developed adhesive capsulitis, which is think of about it as like frozen shoulder. And I hadn't injured it. I hadn't done anything. I was like, what is going on? So I went to a friend of mine who is a uh, orthopedic surgeon. He's like, Lori, there are three things that are gonna cause this. It's over 40, okay. Uh, nothing I can do about that. <laughs> diabetes, never had diabetes and hyperthyroidism. I was like, hyperthyroidism, what? Hmm, checked my TSH, zero. It was literally zero. My, I had had wow. escalating doses of levothyroxine for 15 years, went on a plant-based diet and suddenly the inflammation, I put out the fire, right? The root cause that was continuing to destroy my thyroid. Um, and I needed less and less medication. Now I will say since, depending on your activity level and where you are since hitting this perimenopausal weird phase of my life, um, needed a little bit more, but I've also been more active in the last you know, six months than I had been in probably the last two years, just because of really focusing on some goals. Um, and so that'll change, right? And you'll see some fluctuation there. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've also had patients who had antibodies, different thyroid antibodies go from 600 to zero right? Eating a whole food plant-based diet. The other thing that's really, really important here is making sure you're getting adequate iodine um, in your diet. So those who go on a SOS free diet, I'm absolutely a fan of, that's fine. You know, removing the salt and they, sometimes they, uh, folks will go to these more fancy uh, salts. These are not iodized, right? So most of us in the United States get iodine from uh, iodized salt. And that would be equivalent of around half a teaspoon a day, um, 150 micrograms daily. You do not need more than that. You don't want more than that because that can also affect the thyroid. The thyroid takes iodine, creates your thyroid hormones. So <clears throat> in the space of when you're looking at iodine, making sure you're getting plenty of that. You can also get it from sea vegetables. It would depend on what you're doing. Um, and you want to want to look at that carefully. Sometimes you can get fortified foods. I think some of the plant-based milks actually are uh, fortifying now with iodine as well as calcium and some other things. So you just want to look at maybe what you're getting. Um, I don't use salt very often, but when I do, I do use iodized salt and I'm not certainly not salting my food daily. Um, but the only way to really check your iodine level is not a blood test because it fluctuates during the day. Um, what you'd want to do is a 24 hour urine collection, right? So, um, it's an unfortunate thing, but you have to click your pee for 24 hours in a nice little jug and turn it in. Um, and that's how you will notice if you are um, iodine deficient. And I've seen a few cases, more than a few actually, um, of some folks who went on a plant-based diet, suddenly their thyroid TSH creeps up just a little bit, maybe in the five, six, they start having symptoms. Everything is great. They're adequate weight and no proper weight. They're eating well. We talk about iodine, we check it, it's low. We get them on a, either a supplement or do iodized salt, completely clears up. Um, so that is that is one thing there. Um, and then when you're looking at um, people are worried about eating certain foods, cruciferous vegetables and things that they are worried about decreasing, it, it's really more of an issue like soy, which is such an important food to consume. Um, it's only a difficult or a problem if you're an iodine deficient person, right? So if you are in a state of iodine deficiency, those foods are more of an issue. So um, I constantly tell people eat two to three servings of soys daily. This includes tofu, tempeh, uh, the soybean, the full whole soybean, edamame, uh, soy milk, um, all those things. They're so important. They help with um, menopause symptoms. They help with uh, bone health, um, decrease risk for breast cancer, recurrence, uh, increased survivability, great source of protein, help lower cholesterol. So if you're not allergic to soy, 
you should be consuming soy, uh, at least try to on a daily basis. Awesome. Love it. You know, what about soy curls? Do you use them? Oh, I love soy yeah. curls. I've never oh, tried them. Goodness. I need to. I throw soy <laughs> curls and everything. Um, okay. I actually met that. I found, hunt down the founder. So they're, they're made in this little tiny town in Oregon. Okay. I'm trying to like, can I get you on my podcast? He goes, no, I don't think so. I was like, he's <laughs> trying to stay, you know, kind of quiet in the background. He's an old <laughs> gentleman. He's like probably close to 80, mm. but it was interesting. They were looking for a good food source when they went on a mission trip to Africa. Okay. They had gone on a whole plant-based diet. And so they, it's really a labor of love. It's a family labor of love in this little tiny town in Oregon. Um, the name has left me, but yeah, I, I'm a big fan of the soy curls. Yeah. Is, is that the only place to get them? Uh, Butler soy curls is the only one I'm aware of. Wow. I yeah. didn't even know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, the, I just wanted to follow up with the iodine test, the urine collection. Is that something you'd recommend for anybody that's got some level of thyroid disease? We should be checking this iodine yeah, on a regular I basis. Think, I think so. If you're not getting a regular iodine source, mm -hmm. if you're, you know, very, really strict, it's not a bad idea. At least check once so yeah. that you understand. Cause once you check it once, you kind of understand what mm -hmm. you need to do. I don't think it's something you have to do annually, mm -hmm. okay. um, but someone also mentioned, uh, I was going to ask, uh, left me in a minute. I just looking through some of the questions here, yeah. but, but yeah, I would think that that wouldn't be a bad idea. Yeah. Be, yeah. Okay. Sure. And how about the role of gluten? With yes. Thyroid? gluten. That was the other question. Um, I think around 15% of people will be affected by the gluten component. Um, if you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, you're probably not getting a whole lot of gluten unless you're just consuming these, you know, these type of mm -hmm. products or the, the certain grains every single day. Mm -hmm. Um, I maybe have gluten two or three times a week just because I'm eating certain grains. Mm -hmm. Most people will be okay, but if you're still struggling, it wouldn't be a bad idea to remove the gluten products. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily start that way just because mm -hmm. there's, that just makes it more restrictive for you. And it's, it's just more difficult because mm -hmm. you need to really be thinking about when you go out to eat in different places, when you're traveling, it just, it just makes it more hard. Mm-hmm. Um, are you familiar with einkorn wheat? Yes. Um, because of Brittany uh, okay. in the kitchen. Yeah. So that's fine too. Yeah. I think that would be, I'm not sure if that's a gluten or not. I'd have to do a little deeper dive on that, but yeah. Um, so this, I just started on this little rabbit hole with it myself with, uh, the blue zones documentary. Uh -huh. They advocate for sourdough. I've been baking sourdough for the past few weeks now. Um, and as I read, einkorn wheat has a much weaker gluten and it has only one of the gluten proteins, the regular wheat, modern wheat normally has two. Um, and so many people that are gluten sensitive can eat einkorn without any problems. Interesting. So I've been kind of experimenting, you know, in our family to see if there's any difference and kind of so far so good. So yeah. um, but I was just curious, it's it's new for me. So I'm uh, yeah, and I mean there's a uh, people saying that they can travel to Europe and different countries yes. and eat gluten containing foods yep. and be fine. So, which is yep. no surprise. Um, yep. We do a disservice to our citizens with our food system. Mm -hmm. so, very much so. Very much so. Um, okay. So let's see. So let's talk chronic constipation um, options instead of taking magnesium. Um, and assuming we're already eating a lot of fiber and a lot of water. Yeah, that those That's would be the fair. first two things. Yeah. And so again, are you on medications that are, you know, slowing down the transit? Um, there are some people who have functional constipation and it definitely would probably be worth speaking to maybe a plant-based GI doc. Um, mm -hmm. cause again, there could be a lot of different things causing it. So if you're eating enough fiber, um, and you're doing everything that you're can, um, as far as hydration and different things, I think definitely it's worth speaking to, um, a GI doc yeah. that's versed in a plant-based diet because mm -hmm. otherwise they just throw you on medications. Mm -hmm. which... We end up in a big loop, right? <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> Um, okay. Well, we'll talk a little alternative medicine. Are you versed on PEMF, pulsed electromagnetic fields? Are you no. familiar with that? I mean, yeah, but I'm not, I'm, I would not feel comfortable speaking to it. I have not done a rabbit hole dive yep. myself on it. Yep. 
Okay, fair enough. How about nitric oxide? So should we be checking nitric oxide levels, focusing on this? I don't think so. I think this okay. these are... Um, so a big fan of checking labs that you're going to act on in labs that actually have meaning. Um, because if you're eating a nitrate rich diet, so these dark green leafies and beans and different things, you're going to be producing enough. I would make sure you're avoiding any type of uh, mouth rinse or something that kills the bacteria because your actual mouth bacteria are an important piece of creation, uh, creating the nitric oxide. And it's just the way it's recycled. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I wouldn't worry about taking nitric oxide tablets or checking it because I, again, what are you going to do? Eat more greens? Okay, mm -hmm. you can eat more greens <laughs> and, right. or stress out about it, right? And the nitric right. oxide tablets, I'm not going to, I don't think are going to be helpful. Again, just get it from your food. So yeah, awesome. Beets are a good source too, right? Yeah, beets. Yeah, arugula, you name it, any um, chard. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you get the dark mm -hmm. green leafies. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay. So supplements and I know personal things, but do you have kind of general recommendations for AMLA for cholesterol? Yeah. Yeah. All the spices and goodies. Yes, absolutely. So, um, as far as supplementation, my one non-negotiable is B12. And, uh, what I found with testing patients is the majority, um, have to take a daily supplement. Um, because one, they're not absorbing it well, they're on medications that prevent it, um, or we're older, uh, some, um, yeah, it, it's just, it, I've just found that they need anywhere between 500 to 1000 micrograms daily, you want to make sure that your level when you check it is above 500 when you get in the lab, so 500 to 1100. And um, I've definitely found that that takes a little bit bit more than what we're typically given. And the reason mm -hmm. I'd say taking much that much more is because we only absorb a very small amount of the actual supplement that we take. So um, there is some passive absorption, but again, that's, it's minimal. Um, so anyway, so uh, yes, uh, the cyanocobalamin is the best, it's the cheapest. And um, the other two that are typically that I end up prescribing uh, or encouraging people to take that I take myself or vitamin D, uh, a good starting dose is 2000 international units daily. This is the RDA. And, um, I take just as kind of an insurance policy until we learn a little bit more is the algae omega threes and, um, anywhere from let's say 350 to 500 milligrams daily. Um, I have a very strong family history of heart disease. And I think if you have any inflammatory condition, these are also very helpful. It's important for brain health and stuff. Um, there is a test, um, it will, that you can check again, if you're a very, uh, fat phobic, like there are a lot of people, like I said, that don't eat nuts and seeds. So you're not getting a good source of ALA, um, which is the precursor to the long chain fatty acids. Um, in a plant-based diet, it's really hard to get that if you're not consuming fish and things like that. So uh, you can certainly eat uh, the ALA rich foods, chia seeds, walnuts, uh, ground flax, all those wonderful foods. They have other wonderful nutrients as well that are important for bone health, selenium and uh, iron and different things. But the key here, I think, and zinc and magnesium, there's, there's a few mm -hmm. um, that we really want to be paying attention to, <clears throat> excuse me, is... Um, Again, this is an insurance policy. So I take just a little bit. I keep my Omega check. Uh, it's, it's a blood test you can get at Quest and LabCorp to make sure that you're kind of in that optimal range because that's the best we have right now. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be harmful as long as you're not taking too much. I think it's just, a, it's just for me, that's how my brain works. Um, and again, I'll leave it to the patients, but the B12 is absolutely the non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. um, with everything else, I really am a big fan. Like I said, let's tracking what you're actually eating, um, put it in chronometer and let's see what you're actually doing. Mm -hmm. um, because at the end of the day, I can tell you all sorts of things, but if you're not eating the foods, uh, you know, it's hard to say, we could check some mm -hmm. labs as well. Um, I'm a little hesitant for people to take zinc supplements just because it decreases your copper absorption because then you run into other issues. Um, you know, potassium rich foods, magnesium rich foods, but these are, again, I feel like these micronutrients, um, the nuts and seeds are a great source, the dark green leafies, mm -hmm. um, beans, yeah, whole grains. There's just so many things that if people are too restrictive, it can be an issue. Mm-hmm. 
Love it. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. So let's talk protein next. So, yeah. uh, and this is coming up, this came up in my group recently, but also, um, with age, right? So is there an age at which we need protein powder? Everybody everywhere says protein, protein, protein. And then, as you said, there's, you know, so many gurus that are like, no, don't worry about it, but yeah, where's the happy medium? I think again, just you have to track it, right? Let's see what mm-hmm. you're actually getting before mm-hmm. we make a suggestion. But let's say if I have someone who is trying to lose weight, right? So we're going to probably put them on a little bit of a calorie deficit just to be mindful of what they're eating. <clears throat> you want to maintain your muscle mass and they're doing some type of resistance training. You probably went up your, your grams of protein daily. Mm-hmm. So definitely after 65, minimally, I would say one gram per kilo. Um, which is 2.2 pounds. Uh, so you can do the conversion for your particular weight. Of course, if someone is morbidly obese, you won't need that much protein. Um, but you'd probably maybe go to more of your ideal weight body mass um, s- suggestions. But the, um, yeah, so I would say um, we can get away with less, I mean, proteins, especially when we're not consuming animal proteins. So we're gonna have a lower methionine diet, which is great for longevity and some other things. Um, we just focus in on those really rich plant-based foods, the soy being one of them, beans, grains, sometimes depending on the person, if their appetite's really small or they're trying to do that calorie deficit, a protein powder is not a bad idea, plant-based protein powder. Um, and we'll use it accordingly, but it doesn't mean that everybody needs it. Um, Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. So I, again, I think it's something that we need to be mindful of because there are people who just eat fruit. And, mm-hmm. and I'm just, I'm just saying it's cause I, cause after I started plant-based telehealth, I've seen thousands of patients that eat just a plant-based diet in every single state in this country. And I'm amazed at how restrictive people can be. And mm-hmm. it just comes back to bite them in the butt. So, mm-hmm. so, um, just really want people to be wide range of foods, mm-hmm. many colors. Um, cause some people are like, oh, I'm just going to do 30 per week or 30 of what, mm-hmm. um, you need to do across the categories, fruits, veggies, beans, whole grains, and nuts and seeds, mm-hmm. different colors of the rainbow. And you're probably going to be okay after that and yeah. include the soy products. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Love it. I love it. Um, let's see. I just came up with it. Oh, do you have a vegan protein powder that you like that doesn't have as much junk as. Yeah. What I like to use, um, is the garden of life meal replacement, uh, chocolate. And then there's the vanilla flavor. I think, um, that one has a lot of good things in it and, um, it's all sorts of foods and there's some uh, probiotics. Uh, they have the B12, they have a few, some of the, maybe those more micronutrient things that we might be missing. So it's just a nice thing to add. Um, mm-hmm. I add one scoop to my morning smoothie every morning and I split it with my husband every day. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. And so I feel pretty awesome taking that and yeah. my patients do well, as stuff yeah. as well. But there's others too. I think compliment anything with compliment. Um, mm-hmm. I know Matt, the two Matts personally, I think this, mm-hmm. they're very um, judicious and where they get their um, source, their mm-hmm. and So um, I wouldn't have any problem taking anything that they offer as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just to clarify. So when you do a, a scoop a day, but you're splitting that in half. So you're getting yeah. half a scoop. Okay. I'm getting half a scoop. Sometimes yeah. scared because my son will sometimes come over and take yeah. a of it. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, all right. So fasting, Yeah. um, good, bad, indifferent, and then also in, let's include diabetics in the conversation. How does that yeah. differ for them? Um, okay. So fasting in and of itself is great, right? So if you look at the data, 12 to 16 hours per day is wonderful. If you do prolonged fast, my greater concern is loss of muscle mass again, Um, and especially in the context of taking medications. So let's bump that over to diabetics, for example. And if you're taking medications, I'd be very hesitant to do more than a typical 12 to 16 hour day fast. Um, just because it may affect you, especially if you're on insulin or any type of medications that cause your pancreas to produce more insulin, you can do fasting, um, safely as a diabetic, but, um, you need to be under the guidance. I think as someone who knows what they're doing, you need to be wearing a CGM 
uh, continuous glucose monitor to make sure that you're being alerted should your blood sugars be dropping um, in a in a timely manner. So um, yeah, I think it allows our body times to rest and digest. Um, you sleep better, right? When you um, have waited at least three hours after your last meal before going to bed, our blood sugars are better. We're not constantly in this hyperinsulin state. Um, and you know, it's a hyperglycemic state. So it's really interesting. I, I run a glucose mastermind and I put people on CGMs, whether they're diabetic or non-diabetic and people think they need to eat five, six times a day. It's like, no, you don't. Um, let's let the body come down. And they're wondering why mm -hmm. their blood sugars are high or their A1C is high. It's like, cause your blood sugars never have a chance to come down. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, that's the CGMs are really, really helpful in so many yeah. ways. Um, but yeah, but I think fasting definitely has its place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I've never learned more about blood glucose and the changes than I did when I have a <laughs> type one diabetic in the family. And it's given me a whole new appreciation, uh, yeah. beyond what I, I thought I understood pretty well already. So it, yes. it's the CGM gives you so much really cool information. Yes, yes, yes. You'll learn a lot about yourself and what I found, it's a really awesome tool to help people make better food choices. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and encourage them to keep their food log <laughs> yes. And so then when we, I'm looking at their data and we're sharing it, I can actually say, okay, this is what happens when you go out and eat yeah. Thai food that's vegan, right. but not necessarily healthy vegan yeah. or healthy plant-based. It's, it's pretty fun to, yeah. it's, it's, it's an eye-opening moment for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stress, Absolutely. what stress will do to your blood sugars, yes. less sleep, what exercise, what getting up and just going to take a shower does. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really cool. It, it, it makes you understand how much is going on in your body behind the scenes that you're affecting. Yeah. Maybe whether you're intending to do it or not. Right. Right. Uh, okay. So let's talk about stress. So any, uh, that's funny. The question was any specific foods to help mitigate the effect of stress. I don't even know who asked this question or if they're here, but I think mm -hmm. it is funny. We, we, in this world, we're like, what, what can I eat? That's going to fix that. Um, and stress is, you know, uh, to me a little bit of a different animal, but what, yeah. what, what are your, what's your take on that? So I, I don't think there's necessarily foods that you'd want to be taking. And by the way, I'm just going to throw this out there. There are people who take ashwagandha. I would ask you to stop. There's really interesting, more recent evidence of it causing liver toxicity, even in mm. people without liver disease. So be, just be careful, please. I, I personally do not recommend ashwagandha. Um, okay. So with that in mind, because then, you know, a lot of people take it for anxiety or depression. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first thing you want to do is move your body, right? Exercise is a great antidepressant, anti-anxiety. I think really being mindful and uh, looking at some type of mind-body practice where we understand that the mind and the body are connected is so very, very important, right? I think a CGM is a, is a good example of this, right? Because mm -hmm. you'll see what the body's doing with thoughts. So um, I'll just share an example of my own. I've worn the CGMs off and on for many years. And um, more recently, I watched, uh, I had one on, it was called the Band of Brothers. I watched this, it's a um, on Netflix love world war ii history and i had, had stopped eating like three hours before i went to bed but that was a really stressful movie like it really got me going i was like looking up article i mean not that anyway it's fascinating so went to bed i had a very vivid dream about world war ii i woke up at 12 30 um i looked at my blood sugars my blood sugars are never like above like 80 at night like they're like mm -hmm. climbed till 12 a.m. to 120. Mm -hmm. Never had that happen. I woke up and it precipitously dropped. I was like, holy moly. Wow. So this is a really powerful, for me, it was a powerful mm -hmm. example of what stress can do, even when you're not even aware consciously of what's going on. So be yeah. mindful of what you're putting into your brain, your eyes, mm -hmm. you know, they're eating every day as well. Mm -hmm. um, the thoughts, the I think, I think gratitude has such a great place to help us mitigate anxiety. Um, you know, community like you're building here discussion and not being afraid, um, to be vulnerable and have a safe place to, to share concerns and, and get the support that you need. It's just so very important. Um, but stress, uh, again, I think breathing techniques, but any mind body thing that you can do, uh, meditation, 
mindfulness practices are just so very important. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so, okay. So a question about, um, somebody transitioning to plant-based cholesterol is going down. This is actually a person that's kind of been on again, off again in the past. Uh -huh. And every time she tries her cholesterol drops, but triglycerides go up. Okay. So a couple of things to think about when people transitioning, many times they're eating processed plant-based foods. So these are going to be foods higher in saturated fats, or they may be higher glycemic foods. So I would say, what are you eating? Mm -hmm. so yes, might be plant-based, but it might not be that healthy. So that's when you'll see these triglycerides bump. There might be some component of insulin resistance. So you'll see higher blood sugars will also increase that. So really, um, I'd say like if you're doing juices or um, refined flour products, a lot of dried fruit, I've uh, seen that. And the other thing is if someone is losing weight, uh, significant weight loss, you'll see a transient elevation of triglycerides as well um, that will clear with it, but it's not like huge. Mm -hmm. um, so those would be the the main things that I would be looking at. Um, and again, it, it, it food diary, keeping track of what you're eating so mm -hmm. that recall is so poor. Yeah. Don't, don't try to recall what you eat, write it. <laughs> yeah. um, because once you write it down, everything that goes in your mouth, that is when we can make actual solid right. decisions and understanding of things. Perfect. Um, do you still see triglycerides increasing from very slow, steady weight loss? No, I want to see it's, drop? it's usually that first okay. beginning yeah. um, or someone starts doing um, prolonged fasting. I'll see okay. a in it. Okay. Um, remember, these are fat cells that are breaking down. They're releasing mm -hmm. the fatty acids. Um, that will happen if someone, uh, let's say, suddenly does a, a severe caloric deficit. Maybe they were pretty stable. Um, those are usually the only times that I've seen it uh, do that. Mm -hmm. Or their okay. diabetes is out of control. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just popping back into the chat here. So uh, somebody that's here live is saying my TSH is 4.230 and normal, according to the chart, reads 4.5. Free T4 is 1.69, normals is 1.77. I'm perplexed by my numbers. Um, If it's normal, I'm not sure why you're perplexed. Could you explain what you mean? Because unless, as long as you're feeling well, these are fine. But if you're not and your cholesterol is remaining high, um, you may want to see a, a drop in your TSH. You would just need to up it. There's a few people that I've seen would benefit from a lower dose T4 and a little bit of T3. Um, but you have to do multiple day, multiple time in the day dosing of T3 because it's very quick. Um, so T4 is converted to T3 in your body. That's the active metabolite. Um, the levothyroxine and those synthroid, those are T4. Um, then there's cytomel, which is T3. Um, and uh, yeah, so again, it really depends on the person. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure what they mean by mm -hmm. perplexed. If they're in the normal range, okay. they're being okay. Okay. Um, so Cindy, if you want to follow up on that, feel free. And then in the meantime, um, somebody's asking about methyl versus cyanocobalamin and you were saying that yeah. cyano preferable. Yeah. So if you think, so the cyanocobalamin, um, is a synthetic, um, and people worry about the cyanide component or something like that. Again, uh, this is a problem if you're a smoker, um, but in everyone else, the evidence is not there. You need to be careful about taking just a methylcobalamin because there are two shoots that um, the B12 needs to go down. Um, so if you're going to do methyl, I'd also add a denosyl cobalamin in there um, because you don't want to just shunt everything to the B1, B12 side. Um, it's hard to explain, but yeah, that, that I, I would do a mix. And I believe complement is mixed. So if you take complement, I, I think they've changed their formulation. So I, I think that would be fine. And does complement offer... B12 and the vitamin D and all the different things that you've been talking about. And yeah. is it all, do they have like a multi that has? They like have a, um, I had to go back and see what they've done more recently, but I mm -hmm. they used to have just the three where it was the omegas, the D and B12. And okay. then they had one with some of the more micronutrients, which would be like, I think they had selenium. They had a little bit of iron, they had a little bit of zinc, um, that iodine, along with the B12D and omegas. Um, I think that was everything. Maybe a little magnesium. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We'll check it out. Um, and then juice fasting. Can you share any thoughts on that? Wouldn't do juice fasting. Not a fan? Um, no, I'd say unless I had someone who, uh, is, uh, cancer unable Mm -hmm. to eat, um, or if they're in a very delicate, um, severe, like IBD, like inflammatory bowel Mm -hmm. disease, that might be an appropriate place then. Mm -hmm. Um, but for the regular person and regular, I would not because you're removing the fiber, you're missing a lot of the phytonutrients. Um, it jacks up your blood sugar really high. Uh, again, I, I would not. So if you're someone who's doing juice fasting and wondering why your triglycerides are remaining elevated, um, that could very well be, or you're seeing your A1C bump a little bit closer to, you know, being pre-diabetic that you mm-hmm. want, I, I would hold that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, any, let's do one more here. Um, and I think this is a good kind of summary one. It's kind of an action step. If we haven't had a physical for a while, like in years, what should we be looking for with regards to blood work? I think a lot of folks go, and I, I get this question a lot. Now that it's a great question for me, but, um, I'm going to a regular doctor yeah. And, and the sort of the presumption is they don't, they're not going to know all these things to check. So what should I be aware of and checking? Yeah, for that? sure. I get this question a lot. And um, this is why, uh, so uh, Brittany Gerudi and I started the healing kitchen, which is uh it's a live, we meet weekly. She shares two recipes and I answer all medical questions. And then we do two workshops every month. Um, for example, next Saturday, we have Dr. Clapper coming in. Uh, then I do a deep dive workshop every month and with an ebook, and you have access to all past and future. Um, that's part of the membership. And last month, I did deep dive for almost two hours with people on All About Labs, 33 wow. page uh, ebook. I mean, I went into wow. everything why you want to check. So let me go over it with you guys. So, number one, can you do all 33 pages with us now? <laughs> Um, I can, let me just send it to you. (laughs) You'll have it for reference. Uh, But it was, you know, the basics that you get annually um, is number one is a CBC, right? So this is a complete blood count. Um, This will check your white blood cells, your red blood cells, your platelets. Um, If you're eating a really healthy whole plant-based diet, you may notice your white blood cell count drop a little bit, sometimes below normal. Um, If you're above, I'd say, Below 2.5 might need to be looking at some things, but not unusual to see that. Um, the red blood cells, you just make sure you're not, hem- you know, your hemoglobin, hematocrit, if they're large, your red blood cells are large, means your B12 may be inadequate. Um, if they're small, maybe that your iron is low. Um, and then we have a complete blood uh, metabolic panels. So that's a CMP. So that's going to be a fast and do these fasting, by the way, eight to 12 hours drinking only water. So you have blood sugar, you have kidneys, you have liver enzymes, your electrolytes. Most of the time, these are fine. Um, uh, the protein and albumin are something to look at. If these are low, you may be looking at, you know, a protein deficient state and make sure that you're getting plenty of protein. Um, and, uh, there's that. I would also do a TSH again, someone who's really being restrictive of their salt intake. It's just a good, a good, uh, check to make sure your iodine is probably okay. Um, then B12 of course, but I also check homocysteine and methylmalonic acid. So the methylmalonic acid and B12, um, and then the homocysteine are required. They, the homocysteine and methylmalonic acid require B12 to be further metabolized, Homocysteine requires a few other things, but the methylmonic acid, if they're elevated or homocysteine is above 10, we want it below 10, um, it may tell you that your B12 is not in an adequate place. So that's why I want your B12 to be above 500. Um, You're not going to be symptomatic. Uh, Your red blood cells should be adequate. Your homocysteine and methylmonic acid should be within normal range. However, I've certainly had people who had um, B12 is above 500 and homocysteine remains above 10, then we have to do a little bit deeper dive and a few other things. Um, but for the most part, people's homocysteine is okay, less than 10. Um, it's just because if it's elevated, homocysteine can increase risk for heart attack or stroke. Um, there are a whole nother pathway. So mm-hmm. those things, so vitamin D, keep it above 30. I'm just going through my head here. Mm-hmm. Um, those would be, you could do an omega check. Wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, and then I would do a ferritin. Um, ferritin is going to be the iron store. So when you do 
um, iron or iron uh, binding capacity, these many times can be normal and or even elevated even in the presence of, let's say, anemia. But if your red blood cells are normal, um, your hemoglobin hematocrit are normal, your iron is normal, but you're still complaining of fatigue, hair loss, uh, restless leg syndrome. And if your ferritin is less than 50 for the hair loss and fatigue, we need to bump it up to 50. This is, this is iron. Sometimes supplementation may be necessary, especially if you have heavy periods. Um, but then again, it goes back to why are we low in iron? Is it not adequate in the diet? Is it an absorption issue? Or is it a loss issue? Um, or were you never adequate to begin with? Or you're a long distance runner? Sometimes that can actually mm -hmm. just have the breakdown of the red blood cells and you lose iron that way. Um, so the ferritin, we want above 50. I've, I would say I've had more than a few plant-based eaters uh, come in and complain about hair loss um, and uh, come to find out um, one, sometimes it's just changing the diet and it clears itself up, uh, but make sure they're getting enough iron, um, which isn't much. It's really not hard to do. You just need to look mm -hmm. at that. Um, okay. So iron ferritin. Those are the main ones. The Omega check, uh, I would say you probably want to be in the range of above five. Um, magnesium, the problem is the body wants to make mm. the magnesium levels normal. So it'd be a little bit harder. You could do iodine if you wanted at least once. Again, it's that 24 hour urine collection. Um, if you do the magnesium, I do an RBC magnesium instead. Um, and cats are stretching. Um, <laughs> I think those would be the main ones. And would you run an A1C or do you yeah. look for yeah, the- Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You could definitely okay. check an A1C. Sorry, mm -hmm. oh, the lipid panel. Sorry. I'm trying to do this from my head here. That's okay. Um, no, I know. So, uh, A1C for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to see also, you could do an insulin resistance score. Oh, um, yeah. You can mm -hmm. do uh, on Quest. It's, uh, it's an advanced cardio IQ. Um, so you get not only your- lipid panel, which of course you want your total cholesterol ideally would be under 150 because that would probably tell you the rest of your parameters are, are nice. But mm. I, look, there are three things that I look at, um, is the LDL. I want LDL less than hundred, preferably less than 70 or 60. Ideally. Um, I will look at, uh, HSCRP, which is an inflammatory marker. Um, we'd like to see it less than one, um, APOB, uh, which is think of it as a little protein that gets on the LDL and makes it more atherogenic or more, uh, it's like taking, if you had a bad guy and they, they were just in a fist fight and then you gave them like a arm, like a weapon, right? So mm -hmm. that's what APOB does. It makes it a much more dangerous LDL. So we want that to be lower by lowering your LDL. That works great. Um, and then you could do a one time, just check uh, LP little a's. This is an independent risk factor. It's completely genetic, 90% genetic. Um, as far as you, there's not a whole lot diet can do for it as of right now that we understand when you look at the, the data, um, you want this less, uh, as low as possible. Um, trying to think here. Yeah. Those, those would be the main ones. And then, uh, I'll share a little bit on, I have a cholesterol lowering protocol um, that works well. I've had patients who cannot get their cholesterol down. I, they work with me. I put them on this little cocktail. Um, it's mostly food. Um, so it's amla powder, which is great. It's Indian gooseberry. Hello. Everyone's, this is Remy. Oh, um, so handsome. <laughs> um, but um, it's an amla powder, probably about a quarter teaspoon uh, twice a day. I, I have them put this in uh, applesauce, about half a cup of applesauce. I put the amla powder, half a teaspoon of Ceylon cinnamon. Uh, we do a tablespoon of ground flaxseed. Uh, what else is in there? Oh, uh, psyllium husk. Uh, there's a Yerba, hmm, the brand Yerba, because all the other psyllium husk, if you look at the research, um, independent tests, they have high lead content. So I'd be very careful, okay. but it's called Yerba something. Um, okay at the moment. And, and then I put them on berberine. Um, mm -hmm. The berberine capsules, um, I think amazing. There were two. Thorn is a good brand. And there was another good brand. Amazing something. Um, but again, when you want to make sure that, you know, what's in there. Um, so what I do is typically have put the 
uh, applesauce, this little cocktail in, and then they take it with lunch and dinner. And the reason they do that is because your body makes cholesterol, right? 80% of it's made or LDL, um, makes cholesterol is in the liver. The rest of your cells make it as well, but we really want to focus in on the recycling of your cholesterol. So the point of consuming these foods, oh, and it's, uh, also taking algae omega threes and two soy products daily. Those are the others. Um, when you consume this with your lunch and dinner, which doesn't help so much with breakfast, apparently, when you look at the research, mm. oh, and one Brazil nut a week, high selenium. Sorry, again, trying to do it off the top of my head. Yeah, I love it. I'm so impressed. <laughs> um, but the LDL is being recycled when you eat food. And so what happens is you consume this, your body, the, those foods grab it and escort it out. Um, and you literally poop out your cholesterol. Um, and I've seen cholesterol drop. When my most recent patient, it dropped, her LDL dropped almost 50 points in three weeks. Wow. By doing that. Yeah. That's awesome. So simple. I mean, it's a long list, but it's simple. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a it's long list. But most of it's food. It's, you know, things yeah. that you're doing, but, uh, yeah. the ample's really sour. So I would, mm -hmm. that's another reason to put in the applesauce and applesauce has pectin, which also helps. And yeah. Okay. Okay. Wow. Uh, I, so that, can you read that from Cindy? That's about the yeah. thyroid question. So I was just concerned about the normal charts actually being correct for me. Oh, okay. Meaning I was making sure I was doing everything possible to keep my in check. I take 113, the relatively well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, if you're feeling okay, because um, remember there is a little bit of risk being in the more, of, as you lower that, right? As you get your TSH, you know, some people get below one, for example, you can accelerate some things like bone loss and you can be more anxious and difficulty sleeping. So it is a very, it is a unique balance. Um, and if you're feeling great and your numbers look good, absolutely. That's fine. Absolutely. Wonderful. All right. So let's just say that we've taken in so much amazing information, but our head's kind of spinning, <laughs> right? Cause it's a lot, you know? Um, what if we're just like, you know what, could you just take care of me? Because I don't know if I trust my doctor to work with me on all these things that I just learned. How can people do that? Can you tell us more yeah. about how that works? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I see patients via telemedicine. Um, I started a uh, whole uh, plant-based telehealth. I was one of the founders. Mm -hmm. uh, we started in 2020 and then I sold it. We sold it to John Mackey, started Whole Foods last summer. And um, I went on and started another company. We're utilizing insurance in certain states. Anyway, it got very complicated very quickly. We decided yeah. to shut that down because we had investors and some other things. But anyway, so now I'm seeing patients independently again. Um, I'm licensed in all 50 states in DC. So as long as you're not in Puerto Rico, I think, or <laughs> Guam, um, I can see you. Uh, uh, if you're outside of the United States, I can certainly see you and just give you some advice, um, but you'd have to rely mm -hmm. on doctors to get testing and such. Um, but yeah, so I can order labs, I can order medications. Um, yeah, anything that you need, we can certainly do. Um, as long as it doesn't require me hands-on touching mm -hmm. Which sometimes I really wish I could touch people because they're like asking questions like, oh, I can't sure. touch you. Sure. <laughs> For the most part, you can do it. I mean, I've been doing telemedicine almost seven years now. So that's awesome. You're such a pioneer in so many ways. And we we appreciate you for what you're doing. We appreciate your time. Uh, of course, for being here with us today. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me and everything you're of doing. Course. You have such a lovely story too. So if oh, you guys think you. Know, you should listen to my interview with her on the podcast, it was great. Love that's it. awesome thank you i'll, I'll uh, share so i posted some links here so we've got drmarvis.com as well as a specific link to the healing kitchen membership as well um i always send a follow-up email so you guys don't have to i know you've already taken a ton of notes so um i will send out follow-up emails that have the links as well so that you can follow up on that and find instagram and youtube and facebook and all the things so that you can just um soak it all up so absolutely um, we will wrap it up at that. We did this like in an hour on the dot. I can't even believe how much we covered. I'm like, there's no way we're going through all of those, <laughs> but we did. And you're amazing. And this has been so very helpful. So we, we thank you and appreciate you. And well, thanks um, for having me. It was lovely. Absolutely. absolutely. Oh, will you tell everyone why you had to do this today and not tomorrow? Oh, I'm running <laughs> I'm <laughs> half marathon. I'm in Boston. And this is the home with my oh. daughter. Um, who's a physician in her last year of family medicine residency. Yay. 
And uh, so we're running it tomorrow and it's going to be cold. Yeah, they have this automatic cat beater. So that's what that is. Nice. Um, but yeah, it's uh, we'll see. It's going to be a lot chillier than I'm going to fly home to Southern California. Nice. Degrees yeah. <laughs> That'll be a nice homecoming. Well, good luck tomorrow. We will be cheering for you. Appreciate it. Enjoy it. it. I love that you, uh, you know, just walk the walk, you run the run. So, oh, yeah, I'm trying. Definitely trying. That's awesome. Well, thank you again. Have an amazing rest of the weekend. Good luck. Bye, guys. Bye bye. Bye. All right. How awesome was that? Oh, my goodness. Really good, right? Um, let's go ahead and take a quick break. Let your brain kind of digest a little bit. Right? Um, so let's do, let's do 15 minutes. Okay. So if you need to, if you want to grab food, come back and eat it with us together. That's great. Um, as I've mentioned before, I know some people popped on, uh, while we were on this session, that's great. Welcome. So glad that you're here and grab whatever drinks you want, potty breaks, whatever you need. And we'll reconvene at 1 15 Eastern time. That is 14 minutes from right now. So if you want to set your timer, go ahead and do that and we'll see you back very shortly. All right.